All right, Luke chapter 7, as we go deeper in our study of Luke this morning, Luke chapter 7, we're going to pick up in the passage that we looked at last week, there was a discussion of John the Baptist, and that's in Luke chapter 7. We're going to look at all of verses 18 through verse number 35, but let's just start with the, the beginning there, and that's the first several verses, Luke chapter 7. And verse number 18. And the disciples of John showed him of all these things. Does anyone know where John is at this moment in time? John the Baptist. Who who knows where John the Baptist is at this writing? Several of us do. He's, He's in prison. He's in Herod's prison. And not too long from now, he's going to die. He's going to be killed by Herod for preaching what was an unpopular message. While he was unpopular with the, while John the Baptist was unpopular with the political leaders like Herod, he was very popular with the people. Very popular. The people loved John the Baptist. In fact, all of the people from the countryside and from the cities, they traveled to hear the preaching of John the Baptist. And just so everybody uh, remembers, because not everybody may know who John the Baptist was, He's different from the Apostle Paul, but what were some unique things about John the Baptist? He's a very, very unique person in the Bible, and for those that might not know, could you share with us what were some very unique things about John the Baptist? Mr. Thompson. Okay, if you didn't know anything else about John the Baptist, that would do it right there. The man's diet consisted of locusts. And I've never seen a locust in real life. Has anybody had locusts? You've you've seen them? No, I know what they look like. I've just never actually seen one in in person. But the man would uh, would take them, would dip them in honey, and would munch on them. That was his diet. Uh, What else was unique about John the Baptist? Yeah, he was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. He was chosen of God... And he actually has the distinction, and this was mentioned, uh, I don't know if really emphasized, but it was mentioned in the message. He has the distinction of being the very last of a very important group of people. The very last one of a very important group of people. Yes. Specifically an Old Testament prophet. He was the very last prophet who would predict the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And unlike most of the other prophets, the other prophets never got to see the one whom they prophesied concerning. But John the Baptist actually was the prophet right when Jesus came. And he pointed to people and said, behold, the Lamb of God, which takes, or he told people as he pointed to Jesus, behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. So he had, he's the last Old Testament prophet. As I said, very popular. What else do we know about John the Baptist? It's not recorded here, but yes, ma'am. He was a cousin of Jesus, a first cousin of Jesus. Absolutely. What else do we know about him? John the Baptist. The greatest of the prophets. Why do you think that was? Because he was filled. Well, many of the, the, I I mean, I don't know that the Bible ever tells us exactly why. I tend to think it's because he was able to be the one to point people directly to Jesus. But regardless, yeah, he is the... uh, he is the, referred to as the greatest prophet. What else do we know about John the Baptist? No, we talked about what he ate, but not what he wore. What did he wear? Camel's hair. He made his clothes. He wouldn't wear, and that's actually going to come up in the, in the account. He didn't wear normal clothes that everyone else wore. He wore the hair of camels. Um, and so he would have been an interesting person. What else might have been unique about him? He baptized in the Jordan River. What was, his, what was his baptism significant of? When people were baptized by John, what were they saying? What was the statement that people were making when John... Because it was different. They weren't baptized for the same reason we're baptized now. We're baptized to show the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But that hadn't happened yet. So clearly, when John baptized, that's not what it was about. What, was, what were people identifying with? What, were they, what statement were they making when they were baptized by John? Yep. Okay. Specifically, they were saying this. They were saying, I'm repenting of my sins, 
and I'm preparing for the coming of the Lord, the Messiah. I'm repenting of my sins, and I'm preparing for the coming of the Messiah. Therefore, it would only be natural if you're baptized by John, and then John says, this is the Messiah, it would be natural that you would receive the Messiah. And that's why at the beginning of his ministry, he, um, the, the, many of the Jews that were following John followed Jesus as well. Many would fall off eventually, but they did. What else do we know? Somebody else about John. Anybody know? What's that? How he died. He was beheaded by Herod. Okay, very good. So I, we, we've got most of this here. Um, and as was said, he was, he was filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. So he would have been a very interesting person indeed. So he's now in prison. And it says here in our passage, verse number 18, the disciples of John showed him of all these things. Well, what things? They showed him about all of the popularity of Jesus' ministry, everything that had been happened. In fact, there was a, there was a man that rose from the dead a few verses earlier, and Jesus, Jesus interrupted somebody's funeral and said, nope, he's not going to be dead anymore. And he brought a young man back to life. And all of these things are happening, and so John's disciples who are, obviously they have constant communication with John, they're going back and forth visiting him in prison, they come back and they say, this is what's going on with Jesus' ministry. But now John has a bit of a disturbing question. And what we're going to see in this passage this morning, and what we've already seen, but I want to talk about a little more, there's really some enemies to our spiritual advancement that you and I can identify with as we look through this. We're going to, we're going to first of all, deal with doubt. And John, actually, John the Baptist, the greatest prophet, has, a, has some questions right now. We're talking about you and I. How do we deal with questions that we may have when we deal with doubt? And what we're going to see is Jesus doesn't rebuke John the Baptist at all. And we'll see how he deals with that. Also, as we go, we're going to see a little bit of drama between Jesus and the Pharisees uh, in how they relate to John the Baptist. And then we're going to see, we're going to deal with a second enemy. If the first enemy is doubt that we have to deal with, the second one is toward the end of the passage, and that is apathy. Doubt and apathy. They're two things that can really stunt the growth and the progression of any Christian spiritual advancement. All right. Did we pray together yet? I can't remember, so if we did, we better do it again. So let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for all the children that uh, came to Sunday school today. We pray that right now in their classes that their teachers would be filled with your spirit and that they would just minister the gospel to them, that the word of God would be real to these children. We pray that uh, <clears throat> among our children, among the children that, are, that represent different families throughout our community that are here today, we pray, Lord, that you would be um, raising up a generation of Christians, of true believers. I pray that you'd work in their hearts, that they'd be saved and that they'd follow you with their whole hearts. We thank you for this and help us to be good stewards of these young, young lives that you've entrusted our ministry with. Now we pray for us, and we pray, Lord, that as we study the Bible, that it would speak to our hearts. We pray that we would be challenged and encouraged by it. We thank you, and we've gathered in your name, Jesus, and in that name we pray, amen. So, John's disciples come. In verse number 19, John calls unto him two of his disciples and sends them to Jesus. And look at the question that he has for Jesus. If anyone should know this, it should be John, right? He should have this thing down. <laughs> but he says in the verse, Art thou he that should come, or should we be looking for someone else? When the men were come to him, they said, John Baptist hath sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? And in that in that same hour, this is Jesus' response to the question. In that same hour, he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits. And unto many that were blind, he gave sight. Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way, and tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, 
to the poor the gospel is preached, and, he, and blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. There are a couple of things that Jesus says in this statement, so just think about that. I want you to read it again. I'm not going to comment on all of them right away, but you, it's important to think about just for a minute what Jesus says here. This is what I want you to tell John, verse 22. After he does more miracles, he says, this is what I want you to tell John. Go your way, tell John what things you have seen and heard. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised. To the poor the gospel is preached, and blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. And the messengers of John, they depart. So, for whatever reason here, John the Baptist has this brief, yet significant moment of, I would call it doubt. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of difficulty that people have when they deal with doubt in their Christian life. Some people feel that, and really unnecessarily so, they feel like being a Christian means that there's, they should never have any doubts about anything at all. They should, never, they, 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 should, they should never have any doubts at all. But that's not true. All believers have struggled with, with different elements of, or different factors that would lead to doubt and wonder and honest questions that a person may have about the faith, about their relationship with God. Who in here has ever struggled with doubts in their Christian life? My hand is up. I'm, I'm raising my hands, Okay. Now, for me personally, and I'm going to ask you to help us out, for me, there, there have been a couple times of, um, I shouldn't say a couple times, there, there's, there's seasons of doubt that we all go through, but a couple different things that, that concern me, that concerned me when I would go through periods of doubt. When I was very young, I really struggled with doubting whether or not I, I truly was a Christian. <laughs> Who else has struggled with that doubt before? Okay, all right, so many, many people. All for different reasons. Some people have doubts. Well, I could never be a Christian because look at that sin I just committed. If I were truly a Christian, then I, then I would never have done that. Other people um, grew up in a Christian home and they worry, is this real to me or is this just something that I've kind of gone along with? Is my conversion real? And they struggle with doubts like that. You've, you've had those doubts. Then there's another category of doubts that people have. And those are doubts that say, well, I, this is what the Bible says, but... I'm having a hard time accepting it. I'm having a hard time believing it. Whether it be miracles in the Bible or whether it be a certain teaching of the Bible. How many have ever struggled with doubts like that? I have. And say, I just don't know. And I'm talking not just before you're a believer, but after. What is doubt, though? What is doubt? How would you, how would you define it? And I don't have a real clever definition or anything like that for you. Is there a difference between doubt and disbelief? I think there is, absolutely. There's a big difference between doubt and disbelief. It's possible for someone to be a believer, but to have doubts that come up in their mind. It's how we deal with those doubts that makes the biggest difference. Okay? So doubt would be, to me, would be questions, would be confusion, would be wonder, would be, it kind of can grip you and say, oh, I, I just don't know, I'm just not sure. And so doubt can last for moments or it can last for longer periods of time. John the Baptist has doubt here. I would say there's two types of doubt, if you want to jot this down, and maybe you could add to this. But there's two types of doubt that creep into all of our lives. Or no, I'm sorry, there's not, not that creep into all types of all of our lives. There's two types of doubt that I want you to think about. One is believing doubt. Do you remember the man that was looking for a miracle in the Bible? He was looking for Jesus to do a miracle for him. And he comes to Jesus in desperation. And he says, and, and I believe he's looking for a miracle for his son. And he says, Lord, I believe. And then he makes a qualifying statement afterwards. Who remembers what the man says? Okay. Yes. He says, Lord, I believe. I think what he's saying there is, I want to believe. There's something in me. I believe, I believe. But then he says, help thou my unbelief. And that, to me, categorizes or it, it illustrates doubt that creeps up in the life of a true believer. There's something about someone who's met Jesus where we know 
there's an assurance down in the depths of our soul that the word of God is true, that Jesus is true, that we have this faith in him. But nonetheless, we are attacked by doubt sometimes. And so the answer of our heart, of a believer, should be, Lord, I do believe. What am I missing here? Where is this doubt coming from? Do you see the difference there? How that's, the, the, that's a believing doubt. But then there is a skeptical doubt or a scoffing doubt. That would be the skeptic. That would be the person that says, I can't believe. I won't believe. And they have their reasons. Well, I doubt this. I doubt that. I doubt that. And because of these doubts, I will not believe. Does that make sense, the difference there? Probably other ways that you could define that. So, you tell me, and we can think about it from even the life of John the Baptist here, what are sources of doubt? What caused, maybe what caused doubt perhaps for John the Baptist here? And what cause could cause doubt for you and I? And how might they be similar? What can be sources of doubt in our lives? And thinking about John here. So I would say that John being in prison, discouragement can be a major source of doubt in our lives. We can, because of circumstances, because of situations, discouragement can be a major source of doubt in our lives. Yeah. Yeah, I think even John the Baptist, this isn't quite what he expected Jesus to do. He's an Old Testament prophet. He's thinking about the kingdom. He's thinking about all of this. God, doesn't, God didn't reveal every aspect of it to John the Baptist. God said, that's the Messiah. Tell everybody he's the Messiah. Prepare the way. That's all you need to know. Go do it. Would it do you think it would have been helpful if, if somebody had sat down to John the Baptist and said, listen, this is what's going to happen. Jesus is going to, he's the Messiah, but he's, first he's going to suffer, then he's going to die, then he's going to rise from the dead, and then the kingdom will come physically later on. John doesn't know any of that. All John knows is, I, was I confused? Did I think I heard the voice of the Lord? Is this, did, did I get this right? Because this isn't, I'm in jail. This isn't a glorious kingdom that's come. I, this was said by, this has been repeated many, many times, but this, I, always, I always remind you this, never, never doubt in the dark what you know in the light. Never da- doubt in the dark what you know in the light. And I, I always remember that, that we go through times of brightness and joy and gladness in our lives when the presence of God is, is real and it's powerful, and then we go through valleys. I'm reminded of the old gospel song from the late 70s the god of the mountain is still god in the valley so never doubt in the dark discouragement will come if you go through a season of doubt it's it's often helpful to step back to look at your life and to say what could be the cause of this what's what's going on am i discouraged remember throughout the bible there are examples of people that had to encourage themselves in the lord david and i believe first samuel chapter 17 he comes home all of their their village, their camp had been raided and all of their families had been taken away captive. And all David's followers say, we're going to kill him. David has been, a, he's failed as a leader. We're done with him. And David, who is not always the strongest, but in this moment, the Bible says that and David encouraged himself in the Lord. Yeah, they were gonna, that's why I said they're going to kill him. So, discouragement, and I think that's a real source of doubt. What is another source of doubt in the believer's life? Where else can doubts come from? Yes. Well, doubts concerning salvation, but but I'm talking about sources. What can cause us, if we're thinking, go through times of doubt, yes, I have. I can think back. There are times I've been discouraged, and I've had doubts. What else, though? So tests of faith. Okay, so if you didn't hear in the back what Wendy was saying was a story from her 
from their early marriage when they'd been raised to, 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 and taught the Bible that you give to the Lord and He'll bless you. And they followed that principle and the blessings didn't seem to be just pouring in right off, right off the bat. So, so maybe, you know, the, these tests of faith that come into our life, that can cause us to doubt. Seriously. Yes, sir. Yeah, so I'm going to try to just put that all together and say when our will doesn't always match with God's will, or we think we understand God's will, but really his will is something different and we have a hard time accepting that because the expectation is not what we thought it would be. These things can cause us to doubt. And we can talk about even more. I want us to stop. That's internal sources of doubt, right? That's us in our emotions, in our minds, okay? How about external sources of doubt? Without us. Okay. So I'm going to put those, that, under the category of satanic attack. I mean, really, Satan's plan... All you have to do is go back to the first chapters of Genesis. In the very beginning, Satan's number one goal is not to get you to do some horrible, wicked, terrible sin. That's not his goal for you right now. His goal with Adam and Eve was to get them to what? Doubt. Doubt the word of God. Exactly. Did God really say that? Is that, yea, hath God said that they... The source of doubt is clearly satanic attack. Now, what Charlie shared with us is one of those forms of satanic attack is the world system around us. And the world system tells us a lot of things. It tells you that there could be no... Some people, some part of the world system tells you there could be no supernatural. It's only a natural world. And how could you believe in miracles and things like that? The world system could tell you that, well, there's so many religions. How can you believe one? How can you do that? Yes, Yeah. And what doubt will do is doubt will paralyze a Christian. And I've experienced that in my life. You're making forward progress in your Christian faith. Happens this is this is like spiritual battle 101. And I don't say that to demean anything. I'm just this is like this is what happens every time. You make progress in your spiritual growth and something comes in, a seed of doubt is planted, you don't walk away, from, well, oh, I had a doubt, ball game over, I give up, no more Christian for me. <laughs> That's not how it happens. What happens is you enter this malaise of, you're just, you try to take a step forward, you can't because there's nagging doubts, there's things, you're just stuck in this place where you're trying to figure things out and you don't get any further. Satan loves that. In fact, he's happy that you're there. Because he knows eventually, if he can keep you in that state, you'll just walk away completely. Doubt, but, but that's what doubt will do. It'll paralyze us, and it's a key tool of Satan to really stunt and paralyze our spiritual growth. So it comes, there's a satanic attack. In fact, that's why I would say you should expect to have doubts. Because, in fact, you think of Job in the Bible, if you know the, the account of Job, Satan's number one goal and he failed with Job but his number one goal was to, uh, to get Job to doubt the goodness of God. His, Job's own wife said look at all the bad things that have happened to you you just should curse God and die just give up on it all. Job said I know that my Redeemer lives <laughs> and he battled the doubt and he had some weak moments if you read that whole book it's a fascinating story he had some weak moments but it, the Bible tells us we should expect doubt to come what my dad shared earlier, right before the crucifixion of Jesus, Peter says, I will follow you to death. <laughs> All right, well, in a few minutes, you're going to have an opportunity to do that. And he just completely melts and falls apart. It's to be expected in our lives. So, I would say, don't think, well, I have doubts. I'm, not a, I'm no great Christian. How could, I, how could I do that? Some of the greatest Christians throughout history have wrestled in different seasons of doubt. 
and the Lord has given them victory over it. Okay, so satanic attack. There's something else, though, that's in the life of, and you may not get this one um, without thinking about it for a little while in, in this, but there's something else specifically that I think was a cause of doubt for John the Baptist. Discouragement, we see, obviously, satanic attack. What? Of course, yeah, absolutely. And I think we hit on that pretty well. But there's another, I think, another source. Just anybody else think they've got something unique here that we haven't talked about yet that could be a source of, that could frustrate someone's doubt, maybe? Okay. All right. I, th I think you got it. I'm saying, no. I'm saying isolation. He's isolated. Isolated from who? Well, for one thing, well, from everybody. I mean, he's in prison, right? Now, he's got his people coming to visit him. But notice what Jesus tells him. He says, tell John the things that you're seeing. What has happened? All these miracles are taking place. I mean, amazing things are happening outside this, the prison walls, right? I mean, just people are being healed. Jesus is preaching and and but who doesn't get to see any of that? John. Yeah, he doesn't see any of it. He's all alone, all by himself. And so what does Jesus say? He says, go tell John what's happening. Go tell John that God is at work, that the ministry is alive and well, that lives are being changed. Be really careful. One guy gets to give this lesson. Come on now. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? It's like The devil's goal, if discouragement comes, then doubt sets in. You're wondering, you're unsure. The devil would love to get you all alone, all by yourself, all away from God's people, all away from everything that's happening, so that he can pick you off. It's just like, it's just like if you watch those, um, I think about those nature documentaries and uh, you, you see the uh, whatever types of hunted, hunting animal. The hunter goes after the prey and there's a whole pack. You know, the lion's going after the, they're going after the gazelles or the wildebeest or whatever. You know, I'm no, I, I'm no safari master here. So, so they go after them all. Wait a minute. They go after them all and what do they do? They pick off they pick off the, 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 they can get them, if they can separate them from the herd, they can separate them from the herd, then they, they get them, they got them. In the Bible, the Amalekites, yes, <laughs> in the Bible, the Amalekites would wait for the people of Israel who were weak and sick and that were falling behind the rest the Amalekites were a despicable group, and they would go in and they would pick off the, the children of Israel who had become separated from the main group of people. Okay? <laughs> go ahead. Hurry. We're out of time, and I got, I got something important to say. Right. Right. Yeah. That is uh, that's the addition principle. You can if you didn't if you want to listen to that one. That's from uh, February the fourth, I think, or beginning of February. We we went to first or second, second Peter and talked about add to your faith. Nobody gets nobody grows by subtracting. You don't take away and grow in your faith. So, so, all right, he's, he's done. Amen. All right, now, so all I'm going to, I've got to finish this because we'll we're not going to get to the rest of it, but we'll, we'll be able to do that next week. So, but I do want to finish this section on doubt. So, <clears throat> God's at work in other people's lives. That's the message that Jesus sends to John. You've got to see it. You're isolated. You're going through discouragement. 
you start to sink into pity party mode, right? Anybody ever been to a pity party? All right. So, yeah, this is bad. This is bad. I'm alone. I'm, you know, I'm poor. I'm old. I'm sick. I'm this. I'm that, right? These are, th these are real things. I'm not diminishing your discouragement, but that, those, that's what we go through. Then we get isolated. But in the meantime, if we would get out of us and get involved with others, we would see, look what God is doing in Dennis's life right there. Look what God is doing in that family. Look what God is doing in that person. Look at all those boys and girls who came to church on Sunday. Look at this and look at that. Go tell John. Go tell John. And sometimes we need somebody to come tell us that God is still working. God is still active if we would open our eyes and see. But then there's something else. If you remember, I told you to think about what Jesus said. He said that the, the, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached, and blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. What is significant about Jesus saying that? And this is where we've got to finish, but this is important. What is significant about that? That's the fulfillment of the prophecy. He's pointing John back to what? Yes. It's not just to look around, but look back at the scripture. It's not just, there's lots of miracles, so I must be the Messiah. He says, no, John, remember what you preached. And don't, if you remember when we began this series, we went to that synagogue in Nazareth. And in the synagogue in Nazareth, Jesus said, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your, in your ears. Do you remember that? Okay, it's happening again. Except now, instead of to a synagogue, he's saying it to John. He's saying, look. This statement, whosoever, uh, blessed is he who shall never not be offended in me, that's, that's talking about the Messiah. You find that in the Old Testament, the idea that he would be the stone that the builders rejected, that, but he's the chief cornerstone. He, Behold, I lay in Zion a cornerstone, elect, a sure foundation. It's all Old Testament prophecy. And Jesus says, John, look what's happening. The scriptures are being fulfilled. And I just have to think, and we don't know exactly what happens, but I just have to think that John's in that cell, the messengers come back, and John listens and John says, yeah, yeah. And his faith is shored up. You're going to go through times of doubt. Think about what's causing it. Then always lift up your eyes to what God is doing in real people's lives. And then get your eyes back on the scriptures. That's where we find the assurance. That's where we find the hope. The, Satan would love to get you out of the scriptures and away from God's people. Because then all the source of encouragement is gone. All right, I, I want to keep going, but I can't. It's over. We're done. If he didn't take all my time, then we'd be fine. But, you know, let's, let's pray. Dear God, we love you, and I pray that you'd help anyone in here today that's struggling with doubt, Lord. Give all of us a confidence in your word, a confidence in your work and what you're doing. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. We're dismissed.